Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not bring us to test, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, we thank you for this. Thank you with all our heart. What a joy it is, Lord Jesus, to know your word in the last 24 hours. Lord, yes, we have not even touched a uh, uh, touched, uh, 0.1%, but Lord, the little that you allow us to, allowed us to learn was had given us such a great joy so much of uh, uh, so much of peace uh, so much of wisdom understanding uh, uh, a life-changing experience for many of us lord we wanted to thank you for this lord your word is what uh, drives us lord when we started this bible study we never thought that we would uh, in, be in any position uh, like this but today Lord, hundreds of people around the world are uh, learning your word, Lord Jesus, through this beautiful ministry. Lord, we want to thank you, want to bless you. Lord, it is no one else, no one else deserves the glory, but you alone, yes. O Master. You alone, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory for the sake of your love and your faithfulness. Thank you for bringing Brother Julius, such a wonderful child whom you have ordained, Lord Jesus, to speak. Lord, every word that he speaks, we believe, Lord Jesus, anointed uh, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, Lord, thank you for his family. Thank you for his commitment. Thank you for making um, him a powerful instrument of you, Lord. Thank you for all the people who are receiving your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, uh, we thank you for the eagerness. Thank you for the desire, the thirst that you have put into our hearts, Lord, to learn your word. Lord, it is, uh, thank you, Lord, nothing else, but it is your work, your spirit's work in our hearts that is giving us the thirst, the desire to know your, to learn your word. Thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for everything that you're doing to me and do, doing to us and all glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jules. So, let's bring, okay, there we are. Okay. <clears throat> been a wonderful journey and uh, today we come to the book of Revelation. All right. So Revelation was written somewhere towards the very end of the first century. The Romans had a special prison for enemies of the empire. It was a rocky island called Patmos. It was a hard labor colony and prisoners were banished there and usually nobody came back. They wasted there and died. So it's like the last stop for the prisoners who were banished to this island called Patmos. Tradition has it that John was punished for preaching the gospel in Asia and he was dropped into boiling oil to die. But he didn't die. Something happened. We don't really know what happened. And they saw that as that this man should not be put to death. And uh, so they banished him to the rocky island of Patmos. So John, preaching the gospel in Asia, traditionally believed to have been tried to be martyred. They tried to martyr him by pushing him into uh, a pot or a, a, a vessel of oil, a boiling oil. And when he did not die, probably the things spilled over and you know he was saved miraculously in that, set, in that setting. They decided not to kill him instantly, but they banished him uh, as a prisoner to the island of Patmos. It was in this desolate island where people are sent to die in this island that John had a series of visions. And that is what we have today as the book of Revelation. John had a series of visions. He was the last Ezekiel of the times. Now today, many, many People of God see visions, okay? We have people who are seeing visions in Medugorje and so many places, uh, Francis, uh, Jacinta, and, you know, uh, Fatima, and Lourdes. We have people who see visions and the church accepts these visions after uh, evaluating them and testing them. Uh, evaluating and testing, in, 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 they have their framework. So after doing that, the church accepts the visions, but it is not added to scripture. The reason is, Scripture 
has been proven to be complete. And that has become a challenge for many people today. I was listening to a God man today who said, uh, who keeps saying, he keeps saying, we should not come under a book. And uh, if we are all going to come under a book, we are going to have a lot of problems. And, you know, I, I knew which book he was referring to. But the point is this, that this book gives you so much of freedom, so much of thought. Most of the progress in the world has come because of the Bible. And people attack the Bible diplomatically. They attack it philosophically. They attack it in practical ways by destroying it and burning it and do all of that. But the Bible has outlived every situation. So why is the present divisions not included uh, in scripture? Because scripture was part of a time which is called the period of the canon, which finished at 395 AD. After 395 AD, there was a slight window open till about 411 AD. So during this time, the various materials were evaluated. Various materials were evaluated. You have a gospel according to St. Thomas also, but it is not part of scripture. Even though Thomas is, a, uh, Thomas is an apostle, you have a gospel according to Judas, it is believed. And there are so many gospels. There are 80 plus gospels, but we have only four. Because the authenticity, uh, historicity, and direct eyewitness reliability was taken into account before they put the gospels in place. That was the leading of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, God knows that we are progressing in time. And across this progress in time, there is going to be a development of technology. There is going to be a development of the human wisdom, which is called science. And uh, this wisdom, people will apply to evaluate. So that also was given by the Holy Spirit as a, as a, as a framework, which should be part of the canon because God is looking ahead and he knows what are the criteria that will be applied to evaluate his word. Until today, the, the Bible stands the test of historicity, the test of authenticity. People don't like what is written in the Bible. That is all right. But they, they, they generally are not able to dispute its authenticity and historicity. All right. So uh, during this time, till about 411 AD, uh, various books of the Bible were brought together. And by 411, 395 to 411 AD, books were selected, made part of the scripture, and then the canon period was closed. When it was closed, the book of Revelation is also has been included. There is consistency in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament. And that is why John is seen as a Ezekiel, last Ezekiel and a Daniel of our times. And uh, he had similar visions like how Ezekiel and Daniel had visions, more like Ezekiel. And so his message, which is part of the visions, has become part of scripture. So John has written for us the gospel according to John. He has written for us three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And the first John was about impositors. Second John and third John is about hospitality to uh, genuine preachers and hospitality to uh, fake people who take advantage of this. That was the three letters about we saw that yesterday. And he has written the fourth uh, document, which is the book of Revelation. So John has contributed four documents to the New Testament uh, Bible, to the New Testament. And John probably wrote this down 60 years after Jesus' death, all right? So John was the longest living apostle and the only apostle who did not die a martyr's death. He died of old age uh, in Patmos is what it is believed. So he didn't die a martyr's death. All the other 11 apostles were uh, died a martyr's death. Now, 11 apostles does not include Judas who went and hung himself. It includes Matthias who was uh, chosen by lot in place of Judas. Now, uh, one lady came and asked me, it's such an important position. The position of an apostle is such an important position. And this man, Judas, took it carelessly and he killed himself. So he vacated that position in a sense. So how can the appointing of the next apostle uh, be done by casting lots? You know, be done by casting lots. How can it be done? That's a good question. That is a good question. So I asked her, what do you expect? How do you want it to be done? And she said, no, it must be through some fasting and praying. And, you know, I said, how do we know that didn't happen? That has happened in the, in the book. Peter says, 
that uh, somebody must take that place of leadership. So not every meal they skipped is recorded in the Bible, you see. So they have approached it with a prayerful attitude. But if you ask the process of casting lots and picking uh, a name, that somehow did not sit well with her. It may not sit well with many people. You know, how can you choose important positions to be filled like that? The Bible says in Proverbs, the lot is cast into the lap. The lot means the dice or the lots is cast into the lap. But it's every decision is from the Lord. See, that is uh, where Peter was relying on. Uh, it's not about chance. Okay. Mm, not about it's chance. Not about fact, chance. In fact, in fact, it, it is more than it is more than 47 times it's mentioned in the in the Bible. Uh -huh. About lot. About a uh, casting lot in book yeah. of Hebrews, Leviticus, uh, yes. uh, yeah. God asked commanding Moses. So even, but then you don't find that happening after the Holy Spirit has arrived. After yeah. the Pentecost, uh, you know, Pentecost, you don't see yeah. that happening. Yes. The casting does not. So I was actually quite, uh, you know, when I had to take decisions, you know. Yeah. So somebody corrected me, you know, saying that, uh, uh, you know, that is a thing which uh, is of the past. Once the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, after Holy Spirit's anointing, Pentecost, you need to focus upon hearing the voice of the Lord mm. uh, speaking to you. Yeah. I felt very, uh, you know, it, it was uh, it was a very nice, uh, you know, this thing, wisdom, uh, suggestion with wisdom, because uh, casting lots, uh, unless you are really, really, you know, led by the Spirit, mm. it can really go haywire also. Yeah. Yeah. So in my life, I've had a situation where somebody had to cast a lot and I had to pick the uh, chit, you know, and um, it was so true, it was so correct. So uh, uh, not that I will resort to doing it. You have to be led by the Lord, to led by the Spirit, because there can be times when there is a pressure on time and you have to come to a decision quickly. And uh, that may not be a technique, you know. So that is why... Uh, uh, depending on the Holy Spirit to lead that next step of how you will take a decision is very important. Now, it does not seem like a practical thing, but the Holy Spirit does lead us into practical matters and he will help us there. So, uh, John is uh, writing this book, Revelation, as a series of visions that he had. So, John's message initially in the first few chapters, uh, up to chapters 3, 1 to 3, is addressed to seven churches. Okay, John is first writing, uh, addressing messages to seven specific churches. Churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Philadelphia is not a, a place in, in the US. It is about a church um, in, in Europe and uh, towards Asia. It is after this message is given to the specific churches, John launches on the revelation of the future of the visions he receives from God. The visions are not always about the future. Okay, uh, A struggle is there to understand the visions. And because of that, people oscillate uh, between uh, interpreting these visions from future to past. It is some things have already happened, some things are going to happen and things like that. All right. But uh, we, we all, when we read the book of uh, Revelation, we can be so confused. And we can really finish the book and say a oh, wow without really understanding much. It's possible, you know, that's, the, that's my experience. When I finished reading the book of Revelation the first time, I just said, wow, Lord, um, too bad I didn't understand much of it. But it is like, like a fairy tale at times. It, it's like uh, it really happened. I mean, the, there's a person who saw these visions. And uh, so the wow factor is there. Uh, so... It, 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 is, it is a factor that amazes you and not that really clarifies things or makes you understand. So after this message, so we can, st we can start understanding what we, what we can basically understand. So you start understanding the structure of the book. And the structure of the book tells us that initially in chapter one, and we're going to read that a little later now itself. Uh, so this chapter one is about the introduction and chapter two and three is about specific messages that God is giving uh, to each of the churches, okay? Each of these seven churches. Why seven churches? Why not eight? There were just seven churches. Now seven is a number of fulfillment. Seven is a complete number. Um, all these kind of things I have heard. I really don't know how seven becomes a complete number, except that if I take it to the book of Genesis, seventh day is the day when God rested 
with uh, withheld himself and after that there was no more creation okay so in that sense seven is a complete number i would say okay i'll agree but uh, not everybody will agree not everybody will accept but as a principle it has been applied like a framework seven is a complete number eight means a number something new you know these kind of things okay you can consider that as criteria but don't consider that as the only criteria all right so to me as i read it again and again and again uh, every year as i go through the book of uh, revelation uh, new thoughts come sometimes it tells me that each of these seven churches are uh, could be seven categories of all the churches that exist today you know uh, the churches could exist in these categories and god still has that message which is very relevant to each of those categories what i'm basically saying is that if there are about uh, a hundred thousand churches in the world today or maybe a crore churches in the world today you could classify these these the crore into seven categories and each of these uh, each of those categories you can describe that this is the mood this is the spirit and this is the way these churches are progressing and you could do that i don't know if uh, if that would be valid but you could think in that direction as well so the, we will not worry right now about the interpretation we'll go on from here let's understand what the book is about how it progresses and then we will come to the essence of it most of the uh, valuable most of the information in the book of revelation oscillates to the past and the future it keeps swinging to the past and the future so we don't know what has happened what is already finished and what is going on right now and what is to come we don't know very clearly so it is difficult to call it a book exclusively of the future so don't say revelation is about the future you know generally most most of us christians believe like that that revelation is about the future well it need not be so some of the events could have already been over why is john seeing an event that is already over because only when god shows us an event that is already past will we be able to connect that to what is being shown in the future so we will know that this as a whole already happened and now this is what god is saying that is going to happen even though it sounds ridiculous it sounds preposterous and unbelievable because this event was already over this could be believed you know so there is a reference point uh, for which god is giving us incidents both in the past and in the future we are encouraged to read revelation um, chapter 1 2 3 you know uh, uh, encouraged to read revelation for that matter but i am going to read that i'll come to that later there have been groups of people who tried to uh understand the book and many of them gave up frustrated and they continue to read it as part of discipline i am part of such people that means there is a part of revelation that i don't understand now some of you may ping me separately and say brother what do you understand about revelation that you share with us why because revelation has a sense of intrigue and mystery revelation has a sense of the future and we all want to know if this corona is co connected to the plagues that are mentioned in revelation and all of that and you know and so on and so forth so it is not about uh, it is not about uh, what somebody understood or what people are explaining on youtube and you know there are a thousand messages or more than thousands of messages in youtube which talk to you about revelation but what i'm saying is i'm i'm giving us a fresh approach to it so that we will be able to approach it rightly uh with the spirit of god leading us okay most important thing the spirit of god leading us so there have been groups of people who try to understand the book and gave up frustrated others are so excited that they believe they have discovered some secret codes and that they have sorted out a lot of it or most of it you know so there are people like this and uh, we all belong to some category or the other so don't feel bad about it this is not new okay this kind of people looking into scripture and trying to uh, looking especially into the book of revelation and trying to interpret it this is not new this has been happening from from the first century itself immediately after john wrote this and the manuscript was available people want to hear from the only surviving apostle you see what is happening <laughs> he has a message i've seen things amazing things and he is full of joy and people would like to know what he read, uh, what he's written and when then then this went uh, viral in its own sense and there have been people trying to interpret the revelation from the first century itself so what is happening today on youtube or various kind of sessions being held about the book of revelation and all of that uh, you know it's not surprising so what makes this book important and mandatory for us why is why is it mandatory i mean i i have typed this out so i feel it is mandatory so i'll have to explain to you 
okay christ uh, for us christian what makes this book important and mandatory for us christians is the claim at the beginning of the book there is a claim at the beginning of the book in revelation chapter 1 mm. verses 1 to 3 itself there is a claim that claim makes it mandatory for us all right so i'm going to read that claim revelation chapter 1 verses 1 onwards the revelation of jesus christ so the book is about a person it is the revelation of jesus christ so john is getting this revelation he is the one whom we read yesterday what we have touched what we have seen what we have experienced we write about that what extra revelation he is going to get now you you understand so he, john has walked with jesus he has leaned on jesus's bosom he is the disciple who loves jesus so much and who jesus also loves in a in, in in a sense that he was special to jesus as the as the most youthful among the lot and uh, or, or a person who had fr who had fresh thoughts or a person who was quiet and who leaned on to jesus to hear his heartbeat and who leaned on to jesus to see if he could uh, uh, get something by being just close and intimate with him so john was such a person but to john an additional revelation is being given and what is it it is a revelation of jesus christ which he did not have here on earth mm -hmm. so it is the revelation of jesus christ which god gave whom god gave him god gave a revelation to whom god gave a revelation to jesus himself now why does jesus need a revelation many people will take this and say listen when you ask jesus when are the times jesus told his apostles it is not for me to know the times it, the times are known only by the father and by that jesus is relegated below the father so he is a created person he is an he is one of the biggest or the greatest or the uh, mightiest of the archangels he is not really god will say some of the jehovah witnesses will argue that and they will give you such a good case for it that if you all listen to them long enough you will move away from the faith so uh, these are some of the arguments they use but we need to understand here that jesus in philippians 2:11 uh yeah in 211 he he who did not consider himself to remain as god to become to to be god is to be robbery in the sense if i look at my people and continue to be where i am it is not right or it is it is just that i am in goodness so he vacates uh, um, all that was not his position as the son he vacates all that is good all that he had and he comes down to be one of us so jesus from the trinity from the godhead from being god has stepped down to become one of us forever and he remains completely as god and completely as man why completely as god when he stepped down how can he be completely to god that is why in philippians 2:11 as we go on it says because of this humility of christ what does the father do the father exalted him back to the same place which he abdicated you see the transaction the father is restoring everything back to christ okay so in christ he has become one of us forever but by way of being restored by the father into the godhead and into the completeness he is accepted back into the godhead where are we we are in christ where is christ christ is in the trinity in the godhead so now where are we essentially we are with christ in the trinity this is one of the most ridiculous claims you can make but if you understand this claim and live by it your life will be one of the greatest lives ever lived on this planet that is the potential so jesus is in the restoration and replenish replenishment of everything that he gave up for us god has restored everything back to him let us read that scripture itself no we we'll read it in uh, we we'll read it in philippians Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, who being in very nature God. That means he was not like God, he was in very nature God. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. That means did not consider equality with God as something to be kept for himself. Uh-huh. but he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant and being found 
in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross okay there at that point there is an exclamation mark now verse 9 therefore god exalted him to the highest place what who is doing god is exalting him back to the highest place eh? and gave him the name that is above every name and that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that jesus is lord to the glory of god the father so in the restoration jesus is given back all the four knowledge of god so this is the this is about the manhood of jesus isn't it this is about the manhood of jesus He's yes talking, paul is talking about the manhood of jesus who lived absolutely. under obedience absolutely oh, that okay what is he doing he is not stepping out of the deity hmm. he is stepping down from the deity without vacating the deity of god hmm. he is extending god to become man hmm. in christ god became man hmm. and many people say he walked on the water he healed the sick because he was god no hmm. that is the perfect human being jesus is the perfect human being operating as man that is why he said you can do the very things that i did and even greater things you see so who did not consider it to be god as something to be kept for himself as something to be grasped grasped means tightly held mm. what is jesus essentially doing he sharing godhood with us mm. no so, so what is what is said is very true if it was if if it was god who was performing uh all these miracles then uh-huh. there we would not been able to do it no yes we yes. would not be able to do it because yeah. there then there is no comparison so Absolutely. here here he you are uh, you know so i'm just trying to you know um, yeah. uh, you know articulate my understanding yeah. here you are saying that jesus became man mm. and the the performance all the miracles that he did was at the, as a capacity of a man absolutely he <laughs> remained humble as a god in the uh, form of man uh, you know, which is true because if you really look at the lives of many, many saints like for example joseph of cupertino yeah. he is known as a flying saint you know he mm-hmm. he you know he just flies around you know mm-hmm. he is also again a man you know for mm-hmm. him to fly around it is actually against the in the law of gravity yeah you know many other uh, in many other saints who have done the miracles they did as a man correct mm. what you're saying is right yes. so which means that once you understand this part of it yeah that that you know it will really uh, uh, you know enhance our relationship with the god and experience the power of god absolutely now uh, tomorrow when we see the origin of evil we will see why satan was after man mm. because satan did not have the details but he got the broad idea that god is going to include man in his godhood mm. that is why there is an image and likeness of man being created that after a narrative after a story line after certain events this human people are going to be included in the godhood in the godhead i would say but it would be technically incorrect because we are not yet there but we are seated with christ we are put in christ ephesians we are in christ in christ we are put in christ and where is christ christ is in the deity he is in the godhead he is seated beside the father having been exalted restored completely so where are we we are in christ are we in the personal in the person of god yes we are in the person of god that is how we should read it and we should accept it with humility though claiming that uh and flaunting that would be matter of pride claiming that to live by it will still be humility but flaunting that and saying other religion people don't have this and all that you know that, that would still be pride because god is including everybody yeah. god's uh, effort is not gather scattering it is gathering he is yeah. gathering okay so this revelation of jesus christ which god gave him to show his servants who are his servants we to show his servants especially john who is receiving it directly first hand but the word is used there servants but who is receiving the uh, vision servant see so much is there in the first verse itself so much of revelation is there in the first verse we are not finished the first verse the revelation of jesus christ which god gave him to show his servants what must soon take place 
That means if you and I choose to be a servant of Christ, we will also start getting the message of this revelation. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. You see the difference? Now he's talking about a singular servant. How does he make it known? He makes it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is what John saw. And this was revealed to him by an angel. Why was it revealed to John by the angel? So that it will be revealed by John to the servants, plural, of Jesus Christ. You and I, we all form part of that if we choose to be servants. Mm. See, we have to choose our positions carefully, not uh, whimsically and uh, not carelessly. Okay, so we there is nothing wrong in asking to be being a disciple. Nothing wrong in asking to be sent forth as an apostle. You know, we think that only the priests and the religious, they are apostles. No, you and I can be apostles. We It is for the Lord to send you forth as an apostle. Yeah. You know, so we shirk back from all these things with a false sense of humility. It's a false sense of humility. In fact, that is one of the ways the devil operates to keep you from your destiny. Mm. Okay. So we got to be careful. So in verse 3, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Why did I say it is mandatory for us to for us Christians to read it? Because verse 3 gives a blessing. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Okay. The time is near. That is what it. That is what that first portion concludes with. So, blessed is the one who reads it and takes it to heart. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. What is written in it, because the time is near. How do you hear it and take it to heart? Hear it means. Let me tell you the technique. Okay. Now, don't come. You should not come and argue with me theologically or doctrinally about. I am not teaching theology and doctrine. I am just teaching you how to become intimate with the Lord and how to practice certain things we can practice like a habit so that uh, we will see the result of it. All right. So how does one hear it and take it to heart? The word hear and heart are almost uh, similar. Only the one T is extra in heart. That does it. So there is something closely connected also. There are intrigues and there are clues in the Indian language also, uh, in the English language also. So, hear and heart. If you want to hear it, you better read it aloud. That is a technique I am suggesting. You read it aloud. Now, when you read it aloud, your children may look at you, your wife may look at you, what suddenly is reading aloud. So, you have to teach them also that some of these things I need to read aloud. It is better to read all scripture aloud. That is why better to wake up early morning, as early as you can, so where you can read scripture loudly without disturbing the others. Okay. Now, if you have a household of people and all of you, all of them have been trained in your household, like you train them like Abraham and all of them are getting up early and uh, reading scripture aloud. So such a wonderful thing. Good for you. Good for the family. And I wish it comes like that. Don't worry. The spirit of the Lord will still maintain order in your household without each disturbing the other. You will still be able to read it loud enough without disturbing the other. Okay. People come and ask all these kind of problems to me. You know, not that they want to sort it out. They just don't want to start it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So um, you read it aloud so that you can hear it. When you hear it, you're taking it to heart. Heart means the deepest part of your spirit. Heart means the, 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 the spirit part of you uh, which is waiting to receive. The spirit part of you which is waiting to receive. That is called heart, not the oracle, ventricle, and you know the mitre, the 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 mitochondrial valve, and all that. Hmm? Heart means the spirit part of us which is waiting to receive. And when the heart is full, it will start giving. That is the function of our spirit being. When the heart is full, it will start overflowing. It starts giving. That is why out of the overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks. How wonderful it, it will be if our heart is filled with good things. What will the mouth speak? Good things. What, what will the mouth speak when, when, you, when somebody hurts us? Good things. What will the mouth speak when somebody harms us? Good things. 
because the heart is filled with it. Right now, we have the knowledge of forgiveness. We operate from the knowledge of forgiveness, not from the spirit. Because in the knowledge of forgiveness, half the time we forgive because we are afraid. Half the time we forgive because we don't know what to do. We will leave it and we will go ahead. Okay, and that we <laughs> somehow think that is forgiveness. Okay, so we have to, the heart is what is waiting to receive. The heart wants to receive because the heart has a nature of wanting to receive from God. And the heart has a nature of getting overwhelmed mm. so that it can also give back to others. That is how the kingdom has been working in the world from the time John the Baptist came till today. And this is the way of the kingdom where God fills you. He blesses you so that you become a blessing to others. All right. So this is uh, this is John. Uh, this is the revelation given to John, and so John receives the revelation, and then the revelation to the seven churches start. Okay, so the revelation is about a revelation of Jesus Christ Himself. Now John touched Peter, touched Jesus. Thomas may even wanted to put his finger in the wounds of Jesus and put his finger in the side. Okay, so all these touches are there. What is the new revelation John is going to get? We'll see that. John sees Jesus now. This is the revelation he's getting. John sees Jesus not as the serving servant king. Okay. But as, or as the humble Messiah whom he has seen on earth. But he sees Jesus in power as the cosmic ruler of all that is there to be. Can you imagine? Just like entire creation is flashing in front of your mind. And Jesus is seated as the ruler of it all. That is the revelation he is getting. Okay. Now that revelation, nobody got. Yeah, that revelation, true. none of the other 11 apostles got. John is getting. But through John, those who are alive will get. Mostly by the time John wrote this, all the apostles were dead. Yeah. Okay. John was the last and the longest surviving of them. All right. So we are getting it. Yeah. So see how blessed and fortunate we are. And that is why it says, in verse 2, uh, verse 3, blessed are the ones who read it. So read. How you should read? You should yeah. read it in such a way that you should hear it. Okay? You should hear it. And when you hear it, hear it and take it to heart. Alright? So that much of structure is there in the first three verses. itself. That is why, you know, first you finish reading the Bible in a hurry. Nothing wrong with it. Just read it. Finish it Genesis to Revelation. The beauty is you won't be satisfied. You will start reading it again. The second reading will be a deeper, different reading. The third will be even deeper. And then you start understanding these hidden structures that you missed the first time itself. You see? So, uh, always um, I, I keep telling people, don't miss. You can miss reading any other book. Doesn't matter if you have not read a Bible commentary, you paid 3,000 rupees and bought it, but it is lying there in your cupboard, you have not read it. It doesn't matter. But don't uh, miss out on the Bible. First, finish reading the Bible. Then, God willing, then you can pick up the other commentaries and things like that. Okay? Because all the that will add to your knowledge. This will add to your heart. So that you can be filled with this. And you can pour out from this. You can overflow from this. What does revelation reveal? It is up to the reader to find out. Now we are coming into the structure that is there for all of us. Okay. It is there for the seeker. It is there for the general reader. It is there for the Bible completer also. You're reading. Okay. Now I come to revelation. I'm just going to complete it. Lord, let me just finish that because I want to finish off. It's like climbing Mount Everest. Now I just want to finish off. Then I will unpack it as to uh, and go to the debrief of what I went through and all that. We'll do that later. But first, let me finish off submitting the thing. You know, that's also okay. But now, the general structures are there for us. What does Revelation reveal? <coughs> it is up to the reader to find out because in a generic sense, it speaks about the times that are the end times. In a generic sense, it speaks about the end times. But in a specific sense, it does generate a sense of mystery and appear shrouded. If it does not appear like that to you, then you should be, by this time, you should be in heaven. Okay. If you don't get a sense of not understanding, if you don't get a sense of mystery and something is hidden, if you don't get that sense, 
then if you think that you understood it perfectly, then you should be in the perfect place. All right. But if you get that sense of mystery, that sense of uh, something, uh, something, is, something is interesting, but I'm not understanding it. That's the way it is meant to be for you and me. All right. Why? Because this will take us deeper into Christ, not knowledge. It will take us deeper into the revelation of Christ. Okay. Okay. Revelation does not remove the mystery surrounding Jesus' return. Okay, everybody wants to know dates and times and what time zone he'll be coming. Will he come in the next 500 years and things like that? I know of, I know of my certain friends of mine. Um, uh, in fact, he's, a, he's not a Catholic, but he's a very good friend with whom I have um, a really paining, painful arguments. But somebody was very patient with me. All right. So uh, his wife was operated uh, because she had the um, uterus, uterine cancer. So she was operated, her uterus was removed and she has such a thick file with all the papers of it. But still she conceived and gave birth to a child after her thing. And they are happy now and they are uh, well settled in the US. So this man, uh, because of his faith, you see, he is uh, living uh, with the expectation that in his lifetime, Christ will come. Okay, so I have friends like that. Okay, so Revelation does not remove the mystery surrounding Jesus' return. Uh, and the end of the world, but it throws light on these events. It gives you an, a kind of an estimation as to how it will happen. Now, uh, estimations are good, but don't make estimations in time zones, okay, in timelines. That means right now we are in 2022. Don't try to make estimations in years, okay? Why? I will come to it later. It cannot be reduced to a timetable with timelines of when events will happen. You cannot. Most of the people who have done that right from first century AD onwards who have done that, they've all gone wrong. Largely on the timelines, they are wrong because they keep predicting next three years, five years, 10 years, 30 years, next 100 years, you know, 2000 plus years have come. So let us not get into the habit of predicting that timeline. There are many people who study all these things. Scholars, they are into theology, they are into uh, various kinds of uh, understanding, archaeology, timelines, there's, they are into, some of them are scientists also. So they try to fit. So, well, well, that's their trip. Okay. And they enjoy it and they have, may have a calling from the Lord to do it. Let us not get worried into that. Most of us are lay people and let's be lay people because God has a special revelation and a special way in which he reveals himself to lay people. He knows we don't have that kind of access to that kind of quantum physics and, you know, the bending of the universe. And when you start uh, after billions of light years, you'll come back to the same point because it is elliptical. You know, all of that knowledge we don't have. And we don't know how it will also happen to us. So if we die, do we go into a different dimension, into a different realm and do we, we go through many realms and do we come back to starting point here and then we claim that we are reborn. You know, so many questions people ask. Don't worry about all that. We are lay people reading Revelation. I'm just giving certain handrails for us to follow if we are comfortable. You can argue about them. That's all right with me. Okay, but don't take them as sacrosanct, only suggestions. So don't make, don't reduce Revelation to a timetable with timelines or when the events will take place when it is going to happen don't get into that kind of prediction because we can we can go south mm. i think south today is actually better we, we can we can be wrong in many ways okay but it can be understood but uh, revelation can be understood in the framework of the sequence of variance events happen you can understand sequencing that means after this this will happen okay that can be estimated but don't get into predicting timelines okay because it, it can be disappointing in summary, Revelation does reveal the final victory of Christ over all the evil that exists and the removal and the destruction of evil itself. In the final summary, you know, the final summary should give us a sense of satisfaction. Christ is defeating all evil that is existent anywhere in the universe. And he is not only removing it, he is destroying evil itself. Okay, now Revelation chapters 1 to 3 talks about the churches here on earth, including the seven churches, okay, and the messages to the seven churches. Chapters 4 to 7, uh, from 4th chapter to 7th chapter, you have the Lamb and the seven seals, 
the lamb and the seven seals. There are going to be three sequences of seven seals, seven seals, seven bowls, and seven trumpets. So each of the seal, when it is broken, each of the bowl, when it is poured, each of the trumpet, when it is sounded, there is going to be an event happening. So we are talking about 21 events. All right. So we can understand that. But when it is going to happen, the, this, uh, this president has come, uh, this, uh, the, this kind of event, this war has happened. That means we are in, in now, you know, that kind of calculation, you don't get into it. I'm not saying it is not for us. If you have an interest, well, go and specialize and qualify and do all of that. You know, God bless you. It's a good thing to do. But since we are not in that, uh, don't keep trying to, because it will bring us half knowledge. You know, we'll be like correcting that person said this brother, this person said this brother. And then you are confused about which person to track or trail or follow. And uh, you're never convinced also which person is absolutely right, because nobody can be absolutely right. This is a progressive knowledge that Christ is giving to his servants uh, and the key thing is to remain in that position as a servant. The moment you become master of something, then probably pride is going to block an area of our spirit where we can receive something from the Lord. All right. So Revelation 4 to 7 is about the lamb and the seven seals. Revelation 8 to 11 is about the angel with seven trumpets, the next uh, set of events. Okay. What is the speciality of the events when each seal is broken? And what is the speciality of the events when each trumpet is sounded? One has to read, spend time with the Lord and come to it. Okay. Then Revelation 12 to 14, the church, you will see the lady who is wearing a crown of 12 stars on her head, signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. She is going to give birth. She is in chapter 12, which is uh, uh, the Catholic Church paints it as the picture of Mother Mary and because she's going to give birth and the dragon wants to swallow her son uh, which was so true in the case of Herod wanting to kill Jesus dragon signifying not just Herod Herod is only the face to it but the powers of this world the kingly powers of this world because Jesus has become a threat as a king who is born in a stable in Bethlehem he is already becoming a threat to Herod who is sitting as the tetrarch of Galilee. Okay, now he's, uh, Jesus is already becoming a threat to him. So what does, when Herod tries to annihilate all the babies below 12 years, or below two years old or so, what is Herod trying to do? It is the spirit of the world trying to destroy this child that has been given birth to by the lady. Okay, so the Protestants believe the lady to be Israel, the restoration of Israel, because she is wearing the crown of seven stars. The Catholics, we believe it to be the personification of Mother Mary. Why would you, and she is clothed in a garment of dazzling white. She has the sun for her garment and she's standing on the moon. Okay, now many of us, uh, we have seen pictures of Mother Mary like that. Uh, all right, that's a depiction of what, you, what is there in Revelation. All right, so people have tried to depict certain parts of Revelation in art and architecture and in uh, in in in, uh, in drawings and things like in graphics okay so uh, chapters 15 to 16 is talking about the seven bowls of god's wrath so with that we have seven seals seven trumpets and seven bowls 17 to chapter 19 verse 10 up to chapter 19 verse 10 there is a different mood it is a mood of punishment upon babylon babylon does not mean modern day iraq Okay, it does not mean that. Babylon signifies. Now, why are these things absolutely, uh, uh, I'm saying it straight. Why can't you take it as modern day Iraq? Well, you can take it. Okay, and that would be your academic uh, pursuit. It would turn out good not to be critical. I'm not being critical. Um, but generally, Babylon is referred to as something that is corrupt, something that is deceptive, something that is attractive, alluring. It is given the form of a woman who, who is sitting as a harlot, as, a, a, as an immoral woman. So something that is attractive, which will draw people into immorality, is the spirit of the age. We are having that spirit of the age right now. Okay, So there is a judgment of Babylon, judgment of the spirit of the age. That means people who are following that spirit also will be judged. So they will also be put to physical punishment, pain. They will go through the, uh, the, the beginnings of their pains have, uh, will start. And that is told in chapter 7 to chapter 19, verse 10. 19, verse 11 onwards till the end, there is a beautiful final judgment over all of creation, especially J Jesus destroying, coming in glory, destroying evil and death and, uh, uh, and doing away with it. 
and then the final victory and also the wedding of the lamb. So this is the content of, uh, that is there for us to understand from the book of uh, Revelation. Don't try to analyze the book. First, let's get the flow of the thought that John is giving us. Really, as you start reading, don't try to analyze it. Don't stop here and there. And uh, you would like to stop, that's fine. But don't interrupt the flow of thought that John is giving you because he is the one who is giving to you. You are the servants. He is the servant. He is the singular who received. And we are the plural who are, who are receiving it now. So go by his speed first. All right. That's a, these are suggestions. These are some kind of general guidance. I think if you, if you can take a, a few of these suggestions, you will be very profitable in reading Revelation. Okay. Now, I'm not bor borrowed this uh, suggestion from here and there. It, some of it is my experience I have put there. Okay. And I, I feel very happy with the experience. Though I don't feel content, I look for uh, more to learn and God will reveal that. <clears throat> Next, ask yourself this question. What does Revelation tell me about Jesus Christ? Okay. What does it tell me about God and about history? History means the story of man and how things are progressing. So you can always um, use these three questions. What does it tell me about Jesus? What does it tell me about God in general, uh, especially Revelation? And what does it tell me about history? That means the way of man and the history of man. You know, so you can you can use these three questions to get into a study by yourself without having anybody else to help you. You can yourself do that. Revelation has a lot of symbolism to it. Now I'm giving you the other side of Revelation. I mean, not the other side in the sense, the deeper side. It has a lot of symbolism in it. The symbols are the ones that make us think. Can you believe God has put symbols and not to confuse you, but to get you deeper? Okay. God has put that to make us think and speculate and come up with various interpretations. Now, you come up with their various interpretations, but keep them to yourself. As of now, I'm not interpreting anything in Revelation. I'm just giving you the overview and the approach to the book. So, okay, so you can come up with the interpretations. Get into a discussion. Don't get into a preaching of it because you still don't know if your interpretation is true and your interpretation has to match in with the whole picture. Please understand, it's a large picture that God is painting. Every reading of the Bible brings us details into that picture and we start seeing pockets of it as a whole okay it's a huge jigsaw puzzle that you and i are putting together and definitely when it comes to revelation don't be in a hurry to finish it we could be very very wrong read revelation chapter one verse one to three we've done that now <clears throat> you read a description of jesus as in given to the prophet daniel like the son of man is there and that we can read Chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Now, you said, no, it's a revelation. We said, no, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, see, if any of the apostles had this revelation, only John has it. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurances, you know, he, he, he receives a, a loud I heard a loud voice like a trumpet which says, write on a scroll and you, what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesians, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. So John hears this voice. Write what you are uh, going to hear and send it to these churches. He was, he's turning around to see from where is the voice coming from. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the son of man. Daniel's. He's using the same phrase from Daniel. Okay. He's using the same. Daniel was written in Hebrew. This is written in Greek. How can you use the same phrase? That a translation of Daniel in Greek is using the same word here. All right. Yeah. Uh, which among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Not, not the bomb. <laughs> Today, when we make the statue, what we will do? We'll make seven golden stars and give it in the hand of Jesus, right? He's holding seven stars. Stars, as you see in the cosmos. He's holding that in his hand. That's the vision John is seeing. Not a replica. Mm. Please understand what John is seeing. He's seeing it in a vision. Son of man holding seven stars in his hand. How would it be? 
Today they are taking one picture of the nebula and sending to us. We are looking at it and getting excited. Wow, we say. A person holding seven stars. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. Out of the mouth of this person came a sharp double-edged sword. The word double-edged means double-tongued. This tomos, okay, which we, we explained in Hebrew 4.12. <coughs> his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Today, the sun is few billion years old and because it is few billion years old the sun has uh, lost some of its energy okay but here he's john is having only a reference point he's telling the sun in all its brilliance that means how would the sun be shining if it didn't lose any of its energy across these few billion years we ourselves in chennai or in kerala cannot bear that sun the heat of that sun when it comes to summer just imagine the brilliance not the heat the brilliance all right. So these are some ways in which you can read it. And this kind of uh, revelation of Jesus, the apostles did not have. Okay. So this is a new revelation. So read it. And verses 17 to 18, Jesus, this Jesus whom you're seeing in all this is making a claim. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. When I saw him, I fell at his. So John turns around to see who's speaking to me about the message of the seven churches. When he sees the son of man, he falls at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. This person, Jesus, the son of man, is placing his right hand on John. That means there is a touch he is receiving from Christ in the revelation that he is receiving. This kind of Christ, this form of Christ he has not seen. Christ in all his glory and power is touching a human being called John. Okay, do not be afraid, he said. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I am the living one, not I was. And the language is so perfect and great. I am the living one, not I was the living one. I am the living one. Now listen what he says next. I was dead. I was dead. He is Jesus, the one who sits on the throne of God who was dead. That means he came and tasted death for us. He was not, he, he doesn't say I was living. I am the living one. Mm. Look at the continuity and the perfection of scripture in its wording. Okay. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Mm. He says, I am alive never to die forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. I hold the keys of death and hell. So where are the keys of death and hell? It is with Christ. Who is Christ? He is the forgiveness of God. When a person chooses to ignore Christ, God bless that person because he's not yet dead. But a lifespan is given to every human being to know Jesus Christ. He is the forgiveness of God. To those who accept the forgiveness of God, the gate is locked because the hands, in his hands, he holds the key to hell and death. Through death, we enter. Through death, we enter. Jesus is holding the keys in his hand. When a person refuses Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 17 he did not send his word in, uh, son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Then verse 18, those who have rejected him are condemned already. Mm. Okay. So this is the danger. This is the danger. So the person who rejects Christ will enter death, but hell will be open for him. Yeah. Now, we should not say that. You know, don't go and say this to your friend in that sense because the grace is still there for them yeah. to receive Christ. And that is our hope. Our hope, our prayer, and our action should be to win that person, to win those souls. All right? Yeah. So this is this is the way. Uh, this is a good, uh, the, I would say this would be a fair way to read Revelation. The seven stars and seven golden lampstands are immediately explained. Some of the things will be immediately explained in Revelation. You don't have to break your head over that. Because as Jesus, as he's starting the Revelation, he's telling, you know, uh, the seven stars 
and the and the seven golden lampstands are immediately explained in chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 i'm reading chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 right therefore what you have seen what is now and what will take place later right what is now and what will take place later the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this the mystery because john didn't understand seven stars in his right hand and he's standing among the seven golden lampstands so Christ is standing among the seven golden lampstands. What is the seven golden lampstands? The seven churches. He's just explaining it. So this, the seven stars are the seven spirits of the seven churches. So there is a spirit, a seven angels. Each, there is an angel assigned to guard these uh, responsibility of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the revelation of the, what the seven stars are and seven lampstands are immediately given. So some things will be immediately given, some things will not be given. So the things that are not given are, are given to the extent that we don't understand because they are supposed to generate in us a sense of mystery, a sense of seeking, a sense of deeper knowing Christ. So if we most of us chase knowledge, so we'll try to find out. But uh, our knowledge should be coming from Christ. That is when it will enter our heart. So what should we do? We always address it. That's why conversation with Christ is important. Conversation with Jesus is so important. Keep addressing your doubts to Christ. That means you are already in a conversation with him. And when you are talking to him, he's not snobbish to turn away and say, okay, this fellow always talks to me. He's always having doubts. No, that is not Christ. You know, this is the way we have conjured up Christ in our corrupted imagination. He is always happy to listen to us. Yesterday, when I took my friend to, um, to Thomas Mount and showed him the tabernacle, the, um, uh, the, the blessed sacrament, and I explained to him, this, this is communion. And he said, uh, he, so he understood it. He was awestruck. And he didn't understand the, 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 the blessedness of the blessed sacrament, which is kept exposed. So he, he asked me a question. Can I go and take it and eat? I said, no, you, you should not go and take it and eat. Well, if you take it and eat, not that it is wrong, but you are out of out of place when you do that. Okay, this taking and eating is participating in communion. Taking and eating is participating in communion. Then I told him, "Do you want to have communion right now? You can have it right now without eating that bread, which is there in the blessed sacrament. Without eating it, you can have a communion right now because you are present and He is present. Please understand this principle." See, participating in communion is the sacrament. Being present for communion is being present because the Lord is present. I told him, you can have communion right now. That's the beauty of the moment. And he was awestruck. So we have to uh, uh, explain these things to our people. So there are some things that are immediately revealed and some things that will take us into a deeper relationship with Christ by way of its mystery, by way of its intrigue, by way of its not, we not being able to understand. Okay, connection, there is a connection in chapter one itself to Ezekiel's vision of the four winged creatures with the heads of, with the heads of a man, lion, ox, and eagle. And we know what these four creatures are. These four creatures stand to be the gospel because the, the winged creatures, what is the wing? Wing means to transport. So the, the vision of a man with the head is the Matthew's gospel. Then we have lion, the winged lion. We have the winged ox and we have the winged eagle. So each of them are given wings because the gospel is meant to spread to the edge of the earth, to the ends of the earth. And that is the vision Ezekiel is seeing. And that same vision will also be there in, in Revelation in chapter uh, 4. Okay. So another thing that... Uh, I keep speculating about. So you don't call in and ask me who, the, who they are because I also don't know. So I'm sharing with you what I don't know also. Okay, 24 elders will be mentioned in chapter 5. 24 elders. Who are they? Okay, so you can break them into... So Jesus tells in one place that uh, he's telling the apostle, don't you know that you will be sitting and judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Okay, so we can assume that the 12 elders are the 12 apostles without Judas, with Matthias, of course. So 12 apostles, all right? So we can we can assume, assume, don't get convicted or convinced by it for, for progressing to see if we are wrong or right. Uh, we can assume that they are the 12 apostles. Who are the other 12? Are they the 12 sons of uh, Jacob in which uh, Reuben was an adulterer? He committed adultery with his stepmother. 
Is he, is he also there on the throne? You know, all these questions come and that's the way we should think. So who are these other 12? Are they representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel? If they are, who are they? Will Joshua and Caleb be there? Okay, they can be there. But the other 10 fellows faltered. No? How can they be there? So these are the kind of questions that we should engage in. And in engaging in such questions, we will be getting into a deeper understanding of the one who is seated on the throne. So I left it blank there because who are they? We can assume one portion, one twelve to be apostles. Who are the other 12? Because there are 24 elders. And these 24 elders have crowns on their heads. And when, when, the, when they see the lamb, they take the crown and throw it on the ground. That means the lamb has crowned them. They are crowned in heaven and not on earth. So the lamb has crowned them. And we can also take it that there are saints. These 24 elders could be some saints. Uh, which the church has crowned us in. We can take it all of them. Take all your questions. Take all your possibilities in your thoughts. So as you can take it, they throw down those crowns and they fall down in worship. So you can see the importance of the one seated on the throne. In chapter 7, you will have some funny numbering starting. 1,44,000. Okay, 12,000 from every tribe of Israel. So 1,44,000 is the number of the people he saw. John is not counting. Eh? The number is given to him. So when he gives that, many people say these are the only people who are going to be saved from Israel. Now, don't get into such kind of speculation. Please understand the principle. The principle is Jesus is gathering, not scattering. Okay, He's not in the process of eliminating people from heaven. He's in the process of including people for heaven. That is our ministry. That is the work of the gospel. So till the time of judgment comes, don't uh, think of eliminating people, even though they are some of the worst people we have to deal with. We have to Love them, accept them in their um, in their weaknesses, and pray for them and work towards uh, bringing them. So, what is this 44,000, 1, 12,000 from every tribe in Israel? Well, we really don't. I don't know the meaning of those numbers, and it's not a deal breaker for me. You know, just because I don't know, I I'm, I'm not losing my sleep over it. But there are times of intrigue. I keep thinking with sitting and thinking with a cup of tea. Some of you may think, whether you are in full-time ministry, so joyful for you, you have all the time, we are cooking, we are going to office, we are driving. Well, I have to do all those things too, you know. Um, I, I have put myself into full-time ministry, but there are things that I have to finish in my business, close it properly. And, you know, there is some uh, settlements of some property to be done in the family. My parents have passed on. All that work is there. Okay, so it is not that <laughs> it is not that I have a lot of time to sit and do this. I wish I had that lot of time and I would sit and do this. That has been my prayer to the Lord. All right. Okay, then you will come across Christ uh, towards the Revelation 20. You will come across Christ's reign for a thousand years. Christ is going to reign for a thousand years. Now, many people have this question. Are we already in that reign? Are we, uh, is that rain coming? And why only a thousand years? After that, there's going to be a time of tribulation again, time of persecution again. What is this? I really don't know what it is. I don't know when that thousand years will happen and all of that, but I know it will happen. So, you know, the sequence of events, don't, don't try to fit it into a timeline because we are not into that kind of specialization and into that kind of a revelation as of yet. See, sometimes God can give you a dream, explain certain, then you go and share it with your spiritual uh, elder, whoever it is, and just don't take a trip off on the dream, you know, make one YouTube video and put it and try to get many likes and, you know, you know that's not the point. That is not the point. And you, you think you may be doing a service, but if you watch all those videos, you're going to end up confused. So your video may be one of a few hundred videos or thousands of videos that are already there. And people are just chancing upon this and that based upon a worldly intelligence uh, algorithms written to uh, be, uh, to search out search terms and see what is your taste and give it. Yesterday, if you watched the, some Marvel movie on Avengers and uh, today you're looking for uh, end days Armageddon, Marvel, uh, these people in back at the back end of Google and uh, uh, well, YouTube belongs to Google itself. So the people at the back end of the search engines try to connect your your internet history and try to make some kind of intelligence out of it and then they'll push some kind of possibility of videos to you. So if I'm doing a search, I may not get the same videos as you get in your search. Do you understand? So you are at the mercy of the spirit of this age. So trust God to give you the revelation and not the internet. All right. So Christ years for a thousand years in Revelation 20 and then recreate the world into a place that represents God's original design 
is mentioned in chapter 21 and 22. That means God is recreating the world into a place that represents God's original design. That means we're going back to the origin, to God's restoring everything back to the original. So the Bible's narrative is a simple one. Okay, this is what we have been studying from Genesis to Revelation. The simple one, it is creation, fall, recreation. Creation, fall and recreation. Through it all, God is gathering a people for himself. People who will participate with him in the Godhead for eternity. That is what is God's project. Emmanuel, God with us. We with him. Ephesians tells us that we are put into him. God says, I, am, I want to make my dwelling place with you. And that is why this project is called Emmanuel. All right. Okay. So without completion of the redeeming work of Jesus recorded in Revelation, we wouldn't have the end of the story. You see, if we just stopped after the book of Jude, just imagine that. Which book will you arrange as the end book? You cannot. And it is the beauty of God that he gives us the book of Revelation as the grand finale where we can put that. And when you finish reading Revelation, you've just been through all the pieces of the puzzle. You've not put the puzzle together yet. Or maybe you put a, put a, we are able to put a few pieces together, but you've just sifted through the various pieces and it blows your mind and you sit back and say, wow, Lord, can I go through this again? You know, that should be your experience. So without uh, this redeeming work of Jesus in Revelation, we wouldn't have the end of the story. It is so important to have the end of the story, leaving our hope for the future in a serious doubt. So thank God for the book of Revelation. All right. So without the book of Revelation, we would just end with the book of Jude or maybe some other beautiful book. We will try to make it and put it as the last book. It won't fit in. God himself has to give the book of Revelation, so that it comes as the grand finale. And thank God for the book of Revelation. We'll stop here at this time. We finished. We will take some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will open for questions. One second, let me just unmute. Yeah. Oh, it's such a it's been a, such a great journey. It's, it's Amen. Very, very good. Amen. So, any questions anybody has? Uh, yeah, just. Uh, brother, I just say something a little more to the seven churches, brother, the seven lampstands. Yeah, you want me to say something more about it? Yeah, I'm not really understood uh, properly, brother. What are these seven churches random? Brother? See, the name? these seven churches, as they are given in the book, they belong to seven places. All right. Now, these must have been the churches. Okay. Now, I'm only now I'm talking to you possibility. Uh, first, I, I, I read out the seven churches are the churches in Ephesus, Smyrna. You will not find Protestant, Catholic, Methodist. You will not find all that, okay? You are finding Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches. It is possible that the message of the apostles went to these first to these churches in these seven places that these churches emerged. We know that there was a church in Ephesus because Paul started it. He's writing the letter to the Ephesians, not to the Ephesian public. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, all right? So we know that these seven churches emerged. It is possible that they emerged through the message of the apostles. And from these seven churches, the messages started to percolate to other ends of the earth. Even though Thomas carried the message to India, it is possible he was routed or rooted Okay, through one of these churches. So uh, the messages to these churches. Now these are not these messages are not lovey dovey messages from God. There are some words of appreciation and some words of stern correction in these seven churches. All right. So that's what these seven churches are. We'll have to read Revelation and suppose you get intrigued with these seven churches. Stop at that point and try to consolidate what you understood till then. Okay, because uh, to the churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, and God is talking some tough language also. And he goes on to say one familiar word in each of the revelation to the seven churches. He says, to him who has a ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay, now to him who has a ear, all of us have ears. Okay, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So it is not enough that we have a physical ear. There is a sensitivity we must demonstrate in our spirit, in our spirit to the Holy Spirit. That means we demonstrate a, 
sensible, uh, we, we demonstrate a certain faithfulness in our spirit to God, where the Holy Spirit will speak and we will be able to hear now. You know, we are mostly listening with our minds, mostly listening, trying to listen with our ear, but there should come a time when when we are so much caught up in the suspense or the intrigue, you know, I like to use these words to get you all interested. And I think it is largely that way too. You know, I'm not just advertising or anything. So I think largely there, there is suspense, there is intrigue, there is mystery, um, and there is shroudedness. Shrouded means coveredness uh, in these things. So one has to read it like that. So when you, when I, when I get a clue like that, no, why is God saying to him who has a hear, let him hear, and he's saying that to the churches. That means. Um, that means it's quite possible that largely the message spoken by God has not been received by the church. You know, this is one of my uh, understanding. Now, don't take that and what tell others. Brother is telling like this that churches are not. No, no. Please don't do that. All right. It's only an example. Thank you, brother. Anybody else? Any other questions? Rosh, you have. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Joes. Uh, nowadays they have these audio Bibles. So, is it the same uh, listening to that Bible? Or um, actually, I don't quite like it. I prefer to read the Bible, read it aloud. But what does uh, Brother Julius have to say on this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because I'm a person who uh, uh, who indulges in listening. Okay, so. Uh, now, my best, my best take is always read it. That's what the book of Revelation says, read. Okay, mm -hmm. so nothing like reading. Why, you know, because reading involves more of your faculties. It involves your touch, your touching tone pages. Some, sometimes, you know, if, you're, if, the, if the pages of your Bible are well used, they will be torn and uh, you'll be sensitive to that. There is so much of it that goes into you doing the reading yourself. There's so much of your involvement in it that your faculties are so functional when it comes to reading the Bible, all right? Your Bible has yes. a certain amount of weight. You will carry it with a certain reverence. You won't carry it as like an empty market bag, you know, uh, empty bag which you're taking to the market, you know? Yes. So you won't do that, definitely you won't. So first recommendation is always read. Now, I do listen to certain, uh, certain type, sometimes scripture. Uh, I do listen when I'm driving. You know, uh, when I'm driving, because I just want somebody to read it out to me. If my wife was uh, traveling with me, I would I would ask her to read it. Always reading and listening helps. Well, somebody else has read it and they've recorded it. Nothing wrong in listening to it. But don't substitute that for reading. You you got okay. what? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Okay, Teresa, you wanted to ask. Thank you, Brother Joe, for these sessions. And also, Brother Julius, thank you so much. And uh, I think especially because of your language and also because you many times say, like, you know, you used to watch a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. I think all this has made it so much more interesting, you know, because it's not like uh, in the usual preacher sense of preaching, you know. It's very nice for common people like us to listen. What I wanted to ask, Brother, is uh, what's the difference between apostle and disciple like you mentioned sometime now yeah. about we all can be apostles yeah. so is it like disciple is closer to the lord than the apostle okay uh, i did explain this uh, before but we'll put it in a very simple way a disciple is a follower of jesus okay a disciple is the one who follows okay, okay. clear yes clear? yes an apostle is a person who sent okay oh. now you cannot be an apostle unless you're a disciple Mm. So where is your starting block? You have to be a disciple. So once you're a disciple, you start following the Lord. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So you follow God in his word. You follow God uh, according to his word and reading his mm. word, obeying his word, failing in his word, coming back to his word, coming back to the Lord. That's, that, that's the cycle of life that we have here. Okay. Right. You can't move away from the Lord. As you do this, you are getting discipled by the word in the first level. At the second level, the spirit starts discipling you because the word and the spirit go together. The spirit will start discipling you. He will start pointing out to you, not to you. When I say to you, please don't feel offended. He will start pointing out to, you, to us, maybe are something wrong with our eating habits. 
He will mm. start pointing out to us something wrong with our sleeping uh, late and waking up late habits. You know, this kind of correction will start coming in. So what is happening? You are being disciplined because now you are getting into the mold of a disciple. All fine, right. Fine. So, Thank first you. your thinking is changing because you read the word next your behavior is getting impacted because the spirit starts moving in he won't mm -hmm. let you uh, you, uh, you know he won't he's not going to let us uh, uh, sleep for Thank the you. irresponsible with our sleep irresponsible with our food irresponsible with that you know my driving changed after coming to read god's word all right mm -hmm. you know I, i'm so afraid of putting stickers on my car saying jesus loves you jesus saves you not because i'm a terrible driver and if I'm like, <laughs> people are going to be uh, you know, scolding me every time I overtake them or something. But largely my driving changed. So what am I saying? I'm getting disciplined. And it is for the Lord to send you out. When God sends you out into the mission, when God sends you out into your purpose, when God sends you out into his harvest, that is when you are getting apostled. That is the sending. The sending is being an apostle. Okay, so all of us can aspire to be apostles, but to do yes. that, you have to be in the process of a disciple. John, uh, Paul is the only person who did not follow Jesus three and a half years, all right, but still mm -hmm. he had to wait three years uh, in uh, Damascus, Arabia zone, waiting for instructions from the Spirit. And then he was commissioned as an apostle, and he was commissioned as an equal apostle, equal to the apostles. All right. So today, why I brought up that point and I keep bringing up that point is we have the office of an apostle. The office of, a, of, of an apostle is the pope, the cardinals, the bishops. OK, you don't be you and I should not go and claim equality with them. No, no, it is not like that. Mm -hmm. There is an office of the apostle in the kingdom of God where God is choosing you to go mm -hmm. forward now. OK, he's okay. sending you out. That sending out is called the, and that is, is being apostle. And that I, I suggest, I recommend everybody to pray that we be sent out as the apostle. Not that we'll go and stake our claim in any cardinal's office or in Rome and saying, we are also apostles. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not in that Yes, sense. yes. Because we used, to, we used to loosely use this word. No, sometimes we say Jesus is disciples, apostles. So I wanted that clarity. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question on hidden manna, white stone, new name. Uh, we will, we wanted to, is, is it a long uh, explanation, uh, Julius? I think he's frozen. Brother, you there? I think we lost. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I think it uh, looks like uh, Julius is, uh, we lost the connection. Okay, so we will, uh, we will uh, now uh, bring uh, this uh, Bible study to a closure. Yeah, brother, brother, could he, I think, one second. yeah, he will join back. Uh, we will, meanwhile, uh, uh, we can, we can probably uh, close it with a small uh words of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. I would encourage, uh, before Julius comes back and makes the final prayer, I would encourage uh, some of you, if you are inspired, to make a, uh, make a prayer of thanksgiving for the last 24 days. The Lord has led us through a beautiful way of uh, learning, understanding the Bible in a nutshell. So let us do that uh, right now as a part of our closing prayer. Anybody can do it. Uh, maybe I can call out Ajit as his name appears first on my list. Uh, Julius, we were we are uh, thinking of uh, we we were just trying to close uh, the session with yeah. a prayer. Yeah. So I wanted uh, you know people just to you know say uh, some words of prayer and yeah. close it. Uh, thank the Lord for this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, then you may can make the final prayer. All right. All okay. right. So, Ajit, uh, would you start? Yeah, thank you, Jesus, for opening our eyes and opening our heart to the world, which is so well explained. And may we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Yes. And thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? I am just uh, not calling out the names. Anyone uh, feel free to uh, make a short prayer thanking the Lord for this great opportunity.
whatever language you wanted to pray you can pray in english malayalam hindi tamil kannada telugu whatever language thank you for thank you jesus for this wonderful journey of learning the bible <laughs> in 24 days in 24 hours is a great great step forward for us to step into the reading of the bible and already which have made me to start i already reached 10 chapters in genesis and 10 uh, psalms and uh, gospel and while reading i could recollect what brother julius told and some of them not most of them i couldn't remember what i remember it helped me to understand the bible earlier when i read once I used to get stuck for certain meanings what it can be but now mind is spirit is helping to focus on every verse what i'm reading so wonderful it is i thank you brother julius and brother jos for arranging this and i look forward for more teachings from brother julius i like the language and the simple and also meticulously he has done it so wonderful god bless him and his family abundantly i thank you jesus i thank you holy spirit thank you above father the way above father is pronounced by julius is so wonderful so touching and so amazing and i could pick up that style rather the deep understanding and a deep love for abba father i could pick up that and i am started doing that a lot of peace is reigning in my heart in my mind and my soul and my spirit thank you brother Ju- jo julius thank you brother jos god bless you both thank you thank you yeah brother jos yeah uh, i just wanted to uh, Tell a small thing. Uh, yeah, we are praying right now. We'll yeah, close yeah. it. Uh, we'll close yeah. it. Uh, close it with the prayer. Then we yeah. can probably, uh, you know, yeah. have a chance. No, I also just say a prayer. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, please thank yeah. you, thank you, God Jesus, for bringing Brother Julius uh, for this Bible class for twenty-four hours. We are really blessed every day and every moment. He is revealed God more and more about the God to us, and the main thing He has taught us how to. have a relationship with god i have never heard a speaker saying uh, you should develop your relationship with god so we are developing it and we are so thankful to you brother julius and brother jos for this great session of 24 hours of 24 days of bible really thankful from the bottom of my heart thank you so much thank you thank you god thank you lord jesus so anybody else we will uh... uh, uh teresa you wanted to pray yeah, yeah. yes jos yeah please uh lord jesus our father and holy spirit i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of the whole group uh to brother julius and brother jos for making this journey 24 hours and 24 days learning bible successful and making everyone uh, knowledgeable and uh, getting the word of god and this session has brought all of us close to god abba father and we really appreciate this session and uh, we really appreciate brother jos for making this arrangement and bringing brother julius wonderful person and preacher for teaching all of us we give all glory and honor to you lord jesus our father holy spirit amen. amen amen thank you thank you brother julius we will close it uh, yes let's close the bracket our father we come into your presence it's been a wonderful 24 days lord and your presence has been so richly with us thank you for the word lord without which we will all be fumbling and lord we just wouldn't have any direction abba but abba in your mercy and grace you have given us your word and we thank you lord for the ways in which you led us these 24 days and we ask you lord that the thirst that you have generated in our hearts for your word and the spirit lord that this thirst would continue for a lifetime lord even as you quench it day after day that we would thirst after you abba 
and we would receive from you and we would overflow in our spirit and be a blessing unto others. Thank you for everything. Thank you for helping us to complete this successfully in spite of so many infrastructure and uh, sickness and weakness and all of that, Lord. Lord, you are always able to do it for us. We will never forget that and we will keep claiming that. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes. Thank you, Brother Julia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Julius. So much, Thank you, Brother Julia. Thank you, Brother Julius. Thank you, Brother Julius. Thank you so much. Thank you, 24 days. Thank you, God bless you both. Thank you, Brother Julius. It would be, it would be very ministry. nice to see your faces also. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we can only hear oh, the voices. Sure. Uh, right. uh, right. Wonderful right. to see the faces uh, once in a while. God bless you all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. See you all tomorrow. See you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.